Good afternoon. My name is Sakina Moore, and I am the program director of the Monuments Toolkits Project. On behalf of the United States Committee of the International Council of Monuments and Sites and the Monuments Toolkit Project, I want to welcome you to our third webinar, Protecting the Legacy of Comfort Women Through Memorials. I wanted to also thank the Mellon Foundation for the generous support without which our work would not be possible. The United States Committee of the International Council of Monuments and Sites, or US ICOMOS for short, is headquartered in Washington, DC, which is the traditional territory of the Anacostan and Piscataway people. It is not merely enough to do a land acknowledgement, but how can we support indigenous communities into the future? With the Monuments Toolkit Project, we are looking at legacies that our societies uphold and are making the links to social injustice health injustice and economic injustice that these monuments have come to symbolize. We do this by uplifting stories that were ignored and untold by inviting conversations as we get into these uncomfortable places. We will offer a toolkit for communities that are facing controversial monuments and monuments of oppression, whether it is removal, reinterpretation and recontextualization. We invite you to visit www.usicomos.org to sign up and receive updates on the work that we are doing. Please be sure to join us for our next webinar, which will be held on September 30th from 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 1.30 Eastern Standard, sorry, 2.30 Eastern Standard Time, uh, where the topic will be recontextualizing monuments of oppression with digital media. Again, welcome, and I want to introduce you to William Humphrey, Program Associate for Research and Publications, who will be moderating today's webinar. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is William Humphrey, and I am the Program Associate for Research, Publications, and Administration for the U.S. ICOMOS Monuments Toolkit. I'm glad that everyone was able to come out on a Friday late afternoon. And I do want to say that this topic for our webinar is in some ways more serious and a much more ongoing issue that is occurring. And it's important to have this opportunity to work with both activists, individuals, and other organizations to talk about issues that are addressed, not just by monuments that oppress communities, but monuments that stand from eras of oppression, both of which in other categories are part of what we seek to highlight in the Monuments Toolkit. So for today's theme of Comfort Women and Comfort Women Memorials, it's important to recognize both the activism, both the repressed history, as well as the legacy of everyone that has been involved in current protests. And it is our goal that this helps inspire new or future action in the movement. I would like to first introduce Executive Director Phyllis Kim. Phyllis Kim is the Executive Director of CARE, the Comfort Women Act Action for Redress and Education, an organization that focuses on raising awareness about the comfort women issue, which was a massive scale institutionalized act of wartime sexual slavery that occurred during both the Pacific War and during World War II by the Imperial Japanese military. As part of a community-based organization, Kim's group joined the movement through the campaign to pass the U.S. House Resolution 121 in 2007 and has been leading a number of campaigns to raise awareness about the Comfort Women movement in the United States 
including the first girl statue in the United States in 2013 over in Glendale. She participated in fighting the subsequent lawsuit to remove the Glendale statue, worked with a multi-ethnic coalition to build the San Francisco Comfort Women Memorial, Column of Strength, and had campaigned to include the Comfort Women history in California's 10th grade world history curriculum, providing teaching materials for both the high school history teachers, collaborating with Sogong University to also create Eternal Testimony, an interactive conversational video with, sur with surviving grandmothers, establishing a Comfort Women online archive at UCLA and more. Please welcome Director Kim. Hello everyone. Thank you, William, for the kind introduction. My name is Phyllis Kim, and before we delve into today's topic, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude for U.S. Committee of the International Council on Mon Monuments and Sites and the Mellon Foundation for providing this forum, and all of you for joining us today. We're well into the 21st century, but the horror of war and the wartime sexual violence seem nearer than we might want to believe. I hope this forum will give us an opportunity to reckon the reasons why these egregious crimes of war are being repeated 77 years after the end of World War II. For some of you who may not be familiar with the term comfort women, here's a brief introduction of the issue. From 1932 until the end of World War II in 1945, the Japanese military government established a system of military brothel and coordinated with the private recruiters to mobilize hundreds of thousands of young women and girls from Japan and Japan's colonies and occupied countries all over Asia and Pacific. Let me share my screen with you. This map was created by a Japanese civil group, Women's Active Museum on War and Peace in Tokyo, Japan. The dots on the map represent the locations of the comfort stations in the occupied areas. Using women's body as a war strategy, hundreds of thousands of young women and girls as young as 13 and 14 were trafficked to the war zones all over Asia and Pacific with the aid of Japanese government and military to areas such as China, Vietnam, Burma, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines and more. The women were considered subhuman or rather the military supply or gift from the emperor. And the comfort stations were often referred to as public toilet. The women went through unimaginable and abominable horrors, including gang rape, physical and psychological abuse, forced abortion, mass murder at the end of the war, and attempted and successful suicide. Only about 10 to 15% survived the war. The survivors lived in silence, quietly suffering from the shame and trauma. After decades in silence, the first public testimony came out in 1991 in South Korea. Some people call it the first Me Too movement because encouraged by Kim hak testimony, more victims came out in other countries as well. In South Korea, in the wake of a successful democracy movement that ended decades of military dictatorship, a movement erupted to demand accountability from the perpetrator government, and the movement grew internationally. The Japanese government tried to address the issue right after Kim hak first testimony came out with Kono Statement and the Asian Women's Fund, but it stopped short of a proper resolution for the largest scale of in institutionalized sexual slavery known to humankind. Since the Kono Statement and the Asian Women's Fund were not adequate measures to resolve the issue, 
1991, uh, in 1996, the special rapporteur Kumaraswamy recommended the Japanese government to fulfill six conditions to properly resolve the Kampra women issue. One, to acknowledge and accept the legal responsibility for the crime. Two, pay compensation to individual victims. Three, make a full disclosure of documents. Four, make a public apology in writing to individual victims. Five, the, uh, teach these historical realities in Japan's schools. Six, identify and punish those responsible. The victims and the advocates added one more condition, which is seven, to build memorials and museums to teach and remember this history. How many of these demands do you think the Japanese government carried out after 30 years of struggle? None. Instead, the Japanese government began a full scale of a history war to erase, whitewash, and revise Japan's war crimes, including the comfort women issue, especially during the two terms of the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The international community responded to the call for justice for the victims. Various UN human rights bodies issued opinions and recommendations for the Japanese government to resolve the issue according to the seven demands, which is the international standards. National resolutions were passed in the US and other countries like Canada, the Philippines, and the European Union. And memorials began to pop up in the US public properties to remember and educate the comfort women issue to the public. The purpose of these memorials were to remember and educate through an art form, but the Japanese government sent its diplomats to the cities that built the memorials to demand them to be removed. The Japanese history deniers sued the city of Glendale to remove the memorial. The city and the community of Glendale fought and won, but it turned out the Japanese government was behind the lawsuit. When the lawsuit was dismissed twice, it went all the way up to the US Supreme Court and Japan's foreign ministry submitted an amicus brief in support of the plaintiffs saying, removing the comfort women statue from Glendale Park is a core national interest of Japan. This is why building and protecting the memorials, which is supposed to be an educational activities, became a campaign against history revisionism and the perpetrators attempt to silence the victims. Let me hear from someone who is intimate um, with the law. So I wanted to make a couple of points. Number one about the uh, Japanese right wing. So when we started this, I mean, I approached Phyllis working with her to get the uh, the monument put up over the course of, I mean, it happened quickly, over the course of a few months, I received easily over 1,000 hate emails. So when I say hate, I'm using a euphemism because what they were writing was beyond belief. And also what was amazing was the research that they did. My entire life, they were feeding back where I was born and what I did, my son, Etc. Etc. So it's not just crazy people. I mean, they spend time to go ahead and attack people and find out what they're about and where they live, etc. And it was all coming from Japan, by the way. And, and I remember. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry I didn't put it in the film, but you, yeah, the horrible things that they said about your son. Yeah. That was like yeah. really bad. Um, so that that's one. Then two, the saga continues. By that I mean that the Japanese government is not giving it up. The last consul here in Japan told the Glendale City Council that he was going back in shame that he had not been able to get rid of the statue there in the city of Glendale. And even and because of that, normally when a foreign service officer, before he finishes his term wherever he's uh, 
uh, appointed, they normally tell him, well, next you're going to Spain or you're going to wherever you're going. In his case, they didn't tell him where he was going just to kind of punish him. So now Flip, to, I guess it's been about a month, the new Japanese consul, I had the opportunity to talk to him, and uh, he said without any doubt that his mission here in Los Angeles, he didn't talk about trade, he didn't talk about, uh, remember these are consuls, they're here really for trade. He didn't want to talk about that. He wanted to talk about what we can do to get rid of that uh, statue. So the Japanese government will continue this for many, many years to come. And we have to be aware of, of what, at, at least as long as the LDP is in power and as long as Abi is in power. So we have to do everything we can to, to keep this alive because they're not, they're not good enough. And, uh, uh, Frank was uh, the mayor of Glendale when we built the statue in 2013, and he shared his, his experience during the Q&A session after the screen of, screening of Shishenjo, a great film, by the way, if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend you to see it. It's Sushenjo, the main battleground in Japanese. So no memorial, not just the Glendale one went up without heavy lobbies against it by the Japanese government and the history deniers. As we speak, as we speak um, in Philadelphia, a proposed comfort woman statue is getting heavy backlash with an argument that the statue is divisive and has nothing to do with the communities in the US. Well, their argument is wrong because Americans and Europeans were also victimized as comfort women during the war. And the issue as a women's human rights issue actually unite different communities, not only the numerous victim communities, but also the Japanese American community that acknowledges the importance of redress for the human rights violation committed by a government. They are the living witness. That's what happened in Glendale where the local Japanese American community remains a strong supporter of the Comfort Women Memorial. So as we try to honor and remember the Comfort Women through <clears throat> victims or through the memorials, we should be pre fully prepared and get ready to fight against these lies. Now, it is also important to point out that the victim's own government often will not stand on the victim's side. In case of the South Korean government, the conservative Park Geun-hye administration struck a backdoor deal with the Japanese government in 2015, which was designed to erase and silence the victims with some aid fund from the Japanese government. And more liberal Moon Jae-in president gave in and acknowledged the 2015 announcement, which he campaigned against during his presidential election because it was far worse than the Kono statement that we discussed. So it is a grave mistake to assume victim government will represent the victims correctly, as we can see in the cases of South Korea, Myanmar, or in other various countries such as um, in South America, Africa, Middle East, and Eastern Europe. So Grandma Lee, now we only have 11 survivors who are living in South Korea and more uh, in other countries. But in South Korea, there's only one Grandma Yong Soo Lee who is still active. Since she broke her silence in 1992, Grandma Lee has been fighting for 30 years, and now she is campaigning the comfort women issue to be referred to the UN's International Court of Justice, ICJ in short, as the most sensible way to bring some finality to the issue before all victims pass away. However, the Korean government has been silent for the past year and a half about Grandma Lee's campaign refusing to make an overture to Japan that the case be heard at ICJ while the Japanese government is escalating its lobby uh, efforts to remove the Comfort Woman Memorial 
were statues around the globe. And this year, the new prime minister Kishida asked the Japanese chancellor, or German chancellor to remove a comfort woman statue in Berlin, Germany. For the past five years, the Japanese government has been blocking the application process of the civil groups from a dozen countries to register the comfort woman documents at the UNESCO's Memory of the World program. Last but not least, in order to prevent similar sexual violence during military conflict from repeating itself, it is important that the UN should consider a process where individual victims, not just the state uh, parties, may bring the perpetrators before an international court, ICJ or ICC, whether the perpetrators be a government or a warlord. And there should be efforts to create funds and resources to help the victims and their families so that there is no there is hope for justice and a way for the victims to not have to wage a lifelong campaign to seek justice like the comfort women had to do for the last 30 years. Thank you for your attention to this grave issue of crime against humanity and thank you in advance for working to advance the case of the victims, cause of the victims of sexual violence against women and educating, protecting, demanding, and even perhaps building more memorials. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. I was actually quite surprised because I did not know that the battle around the Glendale monument had actually reached both the consulate and the mayor himself. So if there's time at the end, I'd love to hear more about that. For our next speaker, I would like to introduce Ms. Sharon Cabusel Silva. Sharon is a longtime women's rights activist from the Gabriela Women's Alliance in the Philippines. She is also active with the human rights and peace movements throughout the country. In 2017, Sharon spoke before the working group of the United Nations Human Rights Council on the state of women's rights in the Philippines. Today, she is the current coordinator of Lila Filipina the Organization of Filipino Comfort Women and Representative of. Please welcome her to the webinar. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, good morning to those who are in the Philippines. It's uh, 4.30 a.m. here in our country. And I hope you bear with me as I have had uh, very little sleep. Um, Probably some of you, Phyllis and um, Judith, would know um, Richilda Extremadura, who was the former coordinator of Lila Filipina uh, for about 15 years. And she just passed away um, uh, the other day um, due to complications of her um, of diabetes and other medical conditions that she has had uh, these past years. Uh, Richilda ser served the uh, Lila Pilipina for about 15 years or more th um, during the most difficult uh, period when most of the Lolas have been uh, have uh, pa uh, passed away uh, one by one. And um, you can just, everyone could just imagine how difficult it is now for uh, f the Filipino comfort women uh, that they have been struggling for more than 30 years um, with very few of them left now, uh, less than 10 of them left now uh, surviving. Um, but justice is yet to be achieved in spite of the many battles on the streets in Philippine and Japanese courts um, at the UN and uh, many other uh, venues uh, that they have uh, tried to uh, bring their cause. Um, but there's so much. Um, or there's very little um, attention that we have received from our own government and justice is yet to be served. 
uh, by the Japanese government. So I, I would like to talk about um, the efforts that Lila Pilipina has done for the past years to memorialize the issue of uh, the comfort women. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the comfort woman statue that was um, uh, installed on Rojas Boulevard, which is the main uh, tourist area uh, here in our country. Um, on December 8, 2017, a comfort woman statue was installed in cooperation with the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. The installation was led by several groups of supporters of comfort women, uh, of the comfort women campaign and other descendants of World War II victims. But only about four days later, on December 12, 2017, um, the cabinet minister, then cabinet minister Yoshihide Suga, um, organized a press conference in Japan, expressing that Japan regrets the installation of a comfort woman uh, memorial in the Philippines and said that it would take up the matter with the Philippine government. On the, around the first um, week of April, um, a, comfort woman, a, a supporter of the comfort women campaign happened to pass by a Rojas Boulevard and saw that, a, um, that some equipments and facilities were being readied to remove uh, the comfort woman statue. So we um, decided to form an alliance that would later be called the Flowers for Lolas, Lolas being the a term that we used to refer to grandmothers uh, here in, uh, in Filipino. So, um, and, us, and um, uh, realizing that the statue was about to be removed, um, we called the attention of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and were told by the NHCP that it was the Department of Public Works and Highways of the Manila City Government that was um, about to remove the statue. And on April 27, despite the protests of uh, the uh, supporters of the Comfort Women campaign, the statue was removed by the um, by the Department of Public Works and Highways, uh, then under the Duterte, Rodrigo Duterte administration, purportedly due to a drainage project that never came. The removal was fully supported by President uh, Duterte, stating that the Philippines should not antagonize Japan over the issue. But we would learn later on the real reason why the statue was removed. On May 4, uh, the Asian Development Bank Summit was held in Manila with an opening speech by ADB President Takehiko Nakao, rolling out ADB's vision for Asia with emphasis on infrastructure building. In August 2019, the statue removed from Rojas Boulevard in 2017 was to be reinstalled at the Baclaran Church in Manila. Uh, because after the removal of the statue, we had decided to look for a second home uh, for the statue. So we were able to negotiate with the Redemptorist Fathers. This is one of the biggest um, churches and oldest churches here in Manila to have the statue installed in the history garden of the church compound. And so we prepared to build, or we were already building a pedestal on which to place the statue and a public event was being organized in order to uh, announce the reinstallation of the statue in its second home. But the statue went missing a few days before the event. According to the artist, government officials from both the Philippines and Japan came to his workshop and took the statue, but he refused to reveal names and he has since refused to cooperate with our group since then. In December 28, uh, on December 28, 2018, a replica of the Girl of Peace statue um, which is a very famous um, uh, statue in South Korea where a, a, a girl 
uh, sitting on a chair or sitting on a chair and beside her is an empty chair, um, which has come to symbolize, you know, the comfort women uh, in, in that country. A replica of that statue was unveiled in a private facility, ironically owned uh, or reportedly owned by a South Korean organization. And this was located in San Pedro Laguna, which is a province next to Manila. Um, and so on December 28, uh, 28 uh, it was um, installed only to be removed three days later on the eve of New Year festivities. According to the sisters or the nuns who were running the institution, um, a group of men from the city government's Department of Public Works also came one morning to the facility, um, uh, placed a white cloth over the statue and removed it on the same, on the same morning. We, at first, you know, we were wondering why Japan was so obsessed with removing memorials referencing its brutal role in history. After all, it happened a, a very long time ago in 75 years. And after all, it is the right of every nation, the right, in this case, the Filipino people, it's the right of our right to remember and understand history as it really happened. We, I could only put it this way, no? uh, the politics of memory in the case of the comfort women uh, issue here in the country, uh, as far as Japan is concerned, also means the politics of war and profit. No? I understand um, that Japan's war spending had uh, increased by I think sevenfold under the Shinzo Abe administration and that there have been efforts that were particularly intense during his administration for Japan to revert back to the path of war and militarism. In fact, the first time that Japan sent soldiers again after World War II for a war exercise happened in the Philippines in October 2018, when Japan became uh, a partner of the U.S. in a war exercises that uh, also involved the Philippine uh, Philippine troops. Uh, Japan um, sent soldiers um, apparently or purportedly as part of the humanitarian um, uh, mission no? um, that, uh, uh, that uh, was done during the war exercise. And secondly, we would always uh, could also only wonder why our own government, the Philippine government, was never really a strong advocate, never really defended um, the, um, the cause of the comfort women. Japan remains as the number one creditor country to the Philippines to this day. And a big portion of the foreign debt um, that the Philippines incurred from foreign creditors I think about 40% no? came from Japan. No? Um, I think this, uh, so we can say that while Japan was um, a foreign colonizer or occupier during World War II, um, there remains this neo-colonial relationship between Japan and the Philippines to this day. And this puts the Philippine government in a very, very disadvantaged position. So that whatever Japan dictates no, um, on the Philippine government, um, the Philippine government is just um, very eager to oblige. Well, we can also take note that while um, this, uh, this, um, for, this uh, loans and debts that Japan uh, provides to the Philippines supposedly um, uh, goes to uh, the flagship projects of the government, um, these funds also are a big source of corruption for the Philippine government. So there you can um, understand why many of our Philippine um, officials, past and current administrations, have never really lifted a finger and have always been um, there uh, to defend uh, Japan no? from the criticisms and protests of um, the comfort women uh, advocates and supporters. 
I would just like to maybe share a few of the um, pictures that um, to give you a visual um, or to help you imagine the um, I, I hope you can see the um, this is the, um, the comfort woman statue that was removed on Rojas Boulevard. Um, you can see that um, uh, the, the statue depicts what they call the resilience of the Filipino comfort women um, who have through the years survived the hardships and the trauma that uh, they experienced. This is the pedestal. You can see the black box at the back. Um, this is the pedestal where the statue was supposed to have been reinstalled. No? This is the Baclaran Church in the southern part of Manila. And this is the history garden of the church, which uh, depicts uh, important points in Philippine history, including the Japanese occupation. And here you can see a, a rendering um, of the, the, the Filipino women who were raped uh, and masked and enslaved by the Japanese Imperial Army in World War II. This is the house that um, in Iloilo City in central part of the Philippines, which was um, the location of which was contained in a medical report uh, that was unearthed by the Japanese, uh, by a Japanese parliamentarian in 1992 and which paved the way for the discovery of the comfort women uh, victims. The medical report also contained a list of names of several Filipino women who were then being treated by a, um, I think a Japanese medical doctor uh, for uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And this um, examination was regularly done on the victims in order to prevent the spread of STDs among the Japanese soldiers. This was the pedestal on which the statue was um, supposed to have been reinstalled. And in spite of the statue being declared missing by the artist, we went ahead with the event um, and installing just a makeshift um, memorial uh, or marker, uh, as you can see. And the two women here, this is Lola Estelita D and Lola Narcisa Claveria are two of the surviving uh, comfort women victims. So today, um, almost 30 years after the first Filipino comfort women came forward with their stories of military sexual slavery in the hands of the Japanese Imperial Army, there are very few survivors. And most of these survivors, and even those who have passed away, um, have never really recovered from the trauma uh, that they have experienced. Trauma not only in the emotional and physical sense, but it is a trauma that they have passed on to their um, descendants, no, at least to the first and second line generation of the families of the Filipino comfort women. Because as war uh, destroyed, uh, ruined the entire nation during World War II, Many of the victims never really got out of poverty, never really got the chance to enter formal employment. None of them, or at least a very few of them, re had the chance to travel and to relocate abroad. So many of them remained in lives of poverty and trauma. And it was only when they joined Lila Pilipina, the Comfort Women campaign, that they, um, um, to a certain extent, no, were able to, um, to, to, to minimize the effects of the trauma that they experienced because it sort of empowered them um, to, to fight for the justice that they have long been uh, wanting. Uh, but for many years, for about 50 years uh, after the war, they only kept the experience to themselves. Many of them never told their families and in fact, um, some of them, in the case of Lola Estelita here in the picture, for example, the children, their, her children only learned about her experience only after seeing her on television, uh, joining the rallies that uh, Lila Pilipina organized in front of the Japanese embassy. So right now, um, our, our campaign 
would be to call on the, uh, the Japanese government to finally atone over the war crimes that it has committed against Filipino comfort women. The war reparations that, um, that Japan paid to the Philippines, um, contrary to the claims of the, of the courts that dismissed the cases that were filed by the Filipino comfort women, has not yet really included the issue of military sex slavery and the rapes that were done uh, against uh, probably thousands of Filipino women. Um, because this issue was not yet known at the time that the reparations um, were being negotiated, uh, being negotiated uh, or even at the time that, uh, um, that the reparations were paid to the Philippine government. So, um, um, so I guess I, I will just stop here and uh, we can um, uh, perhaps answer questions during the open forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. And next, our final panelist for today is Ms. Judith Merkinson. Judith is a long-term women's and human rights activist. She began her association with the Comfort Women Movement in 1991, when she co-organized the first North American tour of a survivor with Gabriela Philippines. She has spent decades doing international solidarity work and is a co-author of the 2019 National Lawyers Guild Report, The Lasselin Massacre and the Human Rights Crisis in Haiti. Judith is also active in the work for the freedom of political prisoners. She is a former president of the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the Lawyers Guild and currently serves as a co-chair of its international committee. Today, Judith is the president of the Comfort Women Justice Coalition, or CWJC. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much, U.S. ICOMOS and the Mellon Foundation. And thank you to Phyllis and Sharon for your really um, interesting reports that make it much easier for me. And uh, I also want to offer deepest condolences to Lula Filipina for losing their long-term leader. I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, so I'm going to briefly discuss the building of the San Francisco Memorial and then discuss sort of the broader issues that are combined in this. The San Francisco Memorial, here it is. And as you can see, three young women stand atop a pedestal and they represent women or girls as, as Phyllis talked about. Um, they were very, some of them were really young. The average age was, was really 16 or 17. So they were teenagers um, and they represent uh, women from the countries where the largest number of uh, women were taken from the Philippines, and this is a Philippine young women, China and Korea. And it's estimated now a long, for a long time, people thought that the number was around 200,000, but it's estimated now that didn't take into account the hundreds of thousands of women and girls who were sexually enslaved from China. And so it could, it's really hundreds of thousands of women and girls. And so they stand and you can see they're standing together, they're barefoot, their hands are clasped together. They look very sad, but very determined. And, and as Sharon talked about, resilient. And they represent a memory of the world, a memory of sexual enslavement. And they represent not only themselves, but the millions of women who have been victims and survivors of gender violence. And down below them is a life-size replica of Hak Soon Kim. And she looks up at them and we believe that she sees her past, her present and her future. And she and they represent the struggle to end gender violence. And they represent this memory of the Japanese Imperial Army and what they did. And they represent the demand to Japan that they officially apologize and they officially adhere to the seven international demands 
that Phyllis laid out. And these aren't just demands of the comfort women. These are actually inter under international law at this point, And they're really recognized as remedies for this kind of violence. And so a lot of people would say to us, how did you get this statue built, especially given all the things that you have heard about uh, from Sharon and Phyllis? And basically, it took the building of a really broad coalition. And this is just an example of all the people. Um, and it was uh, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, Filipino Americans, plus nationals from all those countries, peace activists, women's activists like myself, human rights activists, really represented hundreds of people who uh, supported a move by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors to um, build this memorial. And from the very beginning, just like in all the other cases that people have talked about, the Japanese government came in and tried to stop the building of this statue. And they did it in many different ways, but they, uh, the Japanese consulate visited every single um, member of the Board of Supervisors, which is the body in San Francisco that governs along with the mayor. They visited the then mayor and tried to influence him. They went to their supporters in the Japanese community and, and said, you have to not support um, the building of this statue. And then they organized people from all over California and the West Coast to come when there was public comment. And unfortunately for them, Actually, we had hundreds of supporters as well, as well as the incredible Grandma Lee, who Phyllis talked about. But the, they really still, the denialists came in force. And their arguments were similar to the ones that Phyllis laid out in terms of Glendale. They said it was, it was aside from the stuff that it wasn't true and all that, which I will show you, they also said that it would build disharmony, it would create racism against Japanese youth, um, and that it just wasn't right to do, although people recognized that it was horrible that the what had happened to the comfort women, building a statue would build disharmony and would also increase the feeling, anti-Japanese feeling in the city of San Francisco, which of course in the United States has a long history of anti-Japanese racism from World War II. So we countered all those and there were many members of the Japanese American community who also countered that, but we still had to deal with denialism. And I'm just gonna finish here. Uh, I think the first thing I'd like to convey is that the comfort women's stories uh, generally propagated in this country are totally false. They are not well, true. For example, 200,000 people, that's not true. Possible recruitment, that was not true. And, you know, say, yeah, uh, sex slaves, that is not true. Mr. Mara, that's not what she said. Are you calling her a liar, please? Um, There's Grandma uh, Lee. Thank you to me. Exciting fast. I do want to address some of the members of the that. audience that came here, though, and, and spoke to deny what happened. And, and I say this with a great deal of love and respect, but shame on you, shame on you, shame on you for denying what happened and shame on you for the personal attacks on this woman, Grandma Lee, who had the courage to fly 
from another another side of the world to come here to speak her truth. Amazing. And by the way, I hope that the Japanese government is not behind some of these denials. And then um, this is what the denialism went all the way, just in the other, as in the other cases, the denialism went all the way up to Shinzo Abe, who said it's deeply regrettable that San Francisco City's assembly vote to accept the statue is at odds with our country's position. Abe stated during leader's question in the lower chamber. He also stated that the Japanese government had filed an objection against the California city acceptance of the statue. Subsequently, the mayor of Osaka, Yoshimura, told then uh, Ed, Ed Lee and then um, who unfortunately died, um, and then Lon our current mayor, London Breed, that if the statue remained, that he would break the 60 year old sister city relationship with San Francisco. So the mayor refused and in fact issued a statement saying how important this statue was. And in fact, Osaka did break that relationship. And I just wanna, you know, in all the times the Japanese government as Phyllis and Sharon have talked about, have issued statement after statement. And in 2021, they issued another statement, and you can find it on the foreign ministry's um, website, that specifically said, and this was part of the 2015 agreement, the numbers are wrong, they weren't forced, and they weren't sex slaves. And they're very, very adamant about those three things. As the previous speaker spoke. But let me show you, hmm. Oh, wait. Okay, this is a very, from a Japanese document, these are regulations for the comfort stations. So this was very deliberate and it was done. You can see that it's institutionalized by the Japanese Imperial Army. And sometimes in the past, people have said, well, there's no evidence. And it is true that the Japanese army, um, when it became clear that the Americans were gonna come in and that they were losing, burned, just as the Nazis did, burned thousands and thousands of documents, but they didn't burn them all. And they kept very good records, just as the Nazis did. And so, there are records, very clear records of requisitioning, of orders of sending women from one country to another. We need 50 women to go to Borneo. We need 50 women to go to what's now considered Taiwan. We need that. And here are all the regulations. So all of their arguments that this didn't happen are completely false and are basically lies. They're the ones that are lying. They're the ones that are denying what it is. And from the very beginning, our statue did not just talk about the past. We also talked about the present. And we were very clear, and so was the Board of Supervisors, that the statue had to represent the struggle against gender violence and sex trafficking in general. That we can't just, the power of these statues has to be that we listen to the voices of the women and that we, the women from World War II and the women from today. And so even though our primary emphasis, this is a Grandma Lee with Hak Sun Kim, even though our primary emphasis of course has to be demanding an official apology from Japan, we have to highlight the fact that this is continuing to happen. And so we also have to question, why did it happen? What gave them permission to do this? And in doing that, we have to look at the relationship between patriarchy and Japanese society, the total interconnection between patriarchy and militarism, not just in their society, but in all societies. And that 
when we look at the treaties that were done that Sharon talks about, it wasn't just that they didn't know about it, it's that they didn't care. They still regarded the fact that women would get raped during war as something that was normal, that was just part of it, and that men really needed this. And the Japanese government said explicitly, we have to provide sex for our soldiers because number one, we don't want them rampaging through the countryside, raping people, but also we want to give them some comfort. And we want to make sure that it's regulated so that they don't get diseases, so that they don't spread secrets to other people, and so that we know what's happening. But we know that life for Japanese soldiers is very harsh, and therefore we have to provide them with some re relief. And that's what we have to counter today. That's when we look at the issue of the comfort women, we have to say that rape during war cannot be tolerated. And in fact, in 1993, uh, the comfort women, many survivors went to an international conference in Vienna, and that began the process where rape as a strategy of war was beginning to be deemed a crime against humanity and a war crime. And that's what it finally was uh, made into international law in something called the Rome Statute, but that's what actually is true today. We wanted also to talk about, we could look at the comfort women and we could see what is it, how do we look at historical denialism in general? How do we look for us in the United States at our own societies? How do we look at how patriarchy and racism, which were endemic in the comfort women system, as you could see by the that requisition or the rules, you know, a Japanese woman would cost the highest, and then Chinese, then Korean, then Filipino, Okinawan, and they the racism towards especially non-Japanese people was part of the way that they could justify and call these women just toilets, that they could deal with it. And we can see that in our own history in the United States, when we look at the history of enslavement or the genocide against indigenous peoples, how sexual violence is being used. And so that's really incumbent upon all of us to look at our own societies and see the relationship between what happened to these women and what's happening to women today. And I think that's, you know, when Phyllis talked about this isn't just in the past that we can use that for the present, we see wars happening all over the world. We have no idea, for instance, what's happening to women in the war in Ukraine or the war in Yemen or in many of the other places. There's femicide. The issue of femicide is becoming really critical in Latin America, and women are beginning to fight against it. And all of this is related to how we struggle and make the demands of the comfort women real. You know, if Japan would actually apologize, it would be something that actually women could use as a way of judging under international law, other societies. But Japan isn't gonna do that because it doesn't fit with their ultranationalism and denialism. And we see this, we cannot look at what's happening without talking about the historical denialism that we see around the world. And we look at this Japan's historical denialism and the denial of women's rights as part of this rise of right-wing ultranationalism because ultranationalism has as its very core militarism and therefore patriarchy. And perhaps one way we can see that is the rise of right-wing nationalism even in our own country. And a good example of that is the recent Dobbs decision which made the federal right to abortion illegal in, in the United States. So I think for all of us, we have to ensure, you know, the, the comfort women have told us over and over again that they 
struggle for justice, not just for themselves, but because they represent the struggle for all women against gender violence. And I think that that's incumbent upon us. It's really important to protect the statues, but just protecting the statues, even though they're so powerful, and we can see that statues are so powerful everywhere, not just that the Japanese government wants to take them down, but we can see, uh, for instance, in the United States, all the fighting about Confederate generals and Confederate leaders and the statues coming down. But we should protect the statues. We should memorialize. Statues give a visual presence to these demands, but just statues isn't enough unless we accompany it by action, by campaigns, and that we continue to demand to the Japanese government and to all governments that the issue of rape during war and the issue of sexual violence in general be addressed and ultimately will end. If we look at the struggle of the comfort women to be part and parcel in that, and we look at their fight as our fight, then we will be very powerful. And we can see that this is not the past, it is the present, it is the future. And certainly I think we owe, you know, the Nainais, the Lolas, the Hymenes, the grandmas, and our own antecedents and those who are gonna come after us, we owe it to all people that we do this struggle, we protect these statues, and that we continue to fight against gender violence. Yeah. There's our statue. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. And now I'm preparing to start the Q&A for everyone that was here that may have a question that they would wish to ask all three of our panelists or even myself. You can please submit them using the Q&A feature on Zoom and I'll review the questions and pose them forward. In the meantime, uh, I wanna ask one that I've had myself. Uh, I would like to first ask, can you tell me more about Kim Hudson and the other comfort women activists that have pushed these monuments into the spotlight? Yeah. Anyone can answer. <laughs> um, out of hundreds of thousands of victims, only a fraction of them survived, and uh, uh, only part of them were able to return home. And uh, some of them uh, registered with uh, uh, government um, in South Korea in the um, late 80s and the early 90s. And uh, um, Kim Hak Soon was one of them who broke the silence first, and then other women decided to join. Uh, Grandma Yong Soo Lee was one of them. Uh, Grandma Kim Bok Dong was one of them. Um, Grandma Kil Won Ok and others, um, you know, became activists um, who attended the Wednesday protest and traveled the uh, globe uh, giving speeches and a meeting with um, uh, UN representatives and uh, politicians and the communities. Um, you know, not everyone uh, was able to be active, but Grandma Lee Yong Su and Kim Bok Dong and a few others were really active. And uh, actually, they came to the U.S. many times um, in support of the uh, memorials. In Glendale, we had an honor of hosting Grandma Kim Bok Dong twice, and she attended the uh, unveiling of the Glendale Memorial. Uh, Grandma Lee Yong Su um, helped 
uh, San Francisco Memorial in 2015, and she also attended the unveiling of the memorial in 2017 as um, Judith shared the photos from those events. So grandma's presence um, were just you know tremendous um, help. And uh, hearing from them directly just moved people because the, the, they were in the living um, evidence of the history and they could speak from their own experiences. And they understood that they were not there just for themselves. They were not there just to get compensation or money from the Japanese government, but they were there to speak for um, the other women who went through the same atrocity and the women, the next generation of women um, so that they don't have to go through the same atrocity like they did. So they are fully aware of these facts and uh, that's why um, they are amazing uh, women's activists and uh, women's rights activists and leaders. I, I would also say that um, Hak Sun Kim, it wasn't that it was a secret, it was known. I mean, this happened to hundreds of women who did survive in all these different countries. There, you know, people knew, but this, the irony of this situation, I, I feel, is that when women get raped, it's our shame. It's the stigma is on us. And the thing I think that's so interesting about the Japanese government is that on the one hand, they felt it was perfectly okay to rape women over and over again, but they know that on the sort of moral compass of, of society, it's not okay so that they refuse to admit that it happened. And I think that's, that's sort of, it's not just the Japanese, it's universally known. So these women um, were able to come out because there was a large women's movement in Asia and around the world that was beginning to address these issues and they had support. And so, but still the fact that they were willing to face the stigma and face being called prostitutes, even though I think it's very important to say that anyone should not be raped you know whether you're a volunteer nobody volunteers to be a sex slave or to be raped hundreds of times or tens times or any time um but the fact that they were able to do that is something that really shows great courage and um and uh, it shows that they are they're their own actors, that they're not just these victims, but they are actually actors and activists in their own right. And I think it's also uh, important to note that many of these victims of military sex slavery were actually also victims of forced labor. So hmm. it's a common uh, story among the Lolas, among the survivors that um, they would say that while they were being raped at certain times of the day or night, but after that, they would be made to do household uh, chores. No, they would even be made to wash the clothes of the Japanese soldiers. And all these were done in a situation where uh, many of them, most of them at least, could not go out of the garrison or, um, or well, in the case of the Philippines, the garrisons that have been existing structures no? that were turned into Japanese headquarters and uh, fortresses, like they could be big houses or hospitals or churches. Um, and this was where, uh, well, one difference between the Korean and the Philippine experience is that the comfort women um, system uh, happened here in the context of Japanese invasions of villages. No, so and the uh, Japanese occupation in the Philippines was quite brief. It was only for about, well, it was just a short three years, but it was just as brutal as it was in any other country that they um, had occupied or colonized. So I think one of the real one of the ways by which we can really 
uh, disprove this argument, this line of reasoning among the Japanese right wingers in the Japanese government that it was not forced slavery is by looking really at how the, the, the women had spent their lives while they were inside uh, those garrisons. Of course, there were a few who eventually became uh, what we would call mistresses of, uh, or, or what would then be called mistresses of uh, the Japanese officials. And there were cases where some of these women were allowed to go out, were even allowed to do some shopping. Um, and that was, I think, one of the main uh, arguments that uh, are being used by the Japanese right-wingers in order to disprove the comfort women narrative. But as Juan Lola would put it, it was a war situation. We had no choice. We were leading good lives at the time. And then this uh, men in uniform just came so suddenly and took everything away from us. So what choice was there for women like us who had been um, raped uh, and imprisoned in these garrisons? So one of them said, I really did uh, choose to become a mistress of the Japanese official in order to save the lives of other Filipinos. And in the case of uh, Lola Rosa Henson, um, it was actually um, one of her, what do you call that? Um, one of those times when she, they were being allowed to do some sunning in the, um, in the um, and when she was able to slip a note or tell a Filipino who happened to be passing by that the, this certain place was going to be raided and that the men were going to be rounded up. And so the, Japan, uh, the Filipino guerrillas were able to, to launch a surprise attack on the garrison and freed her and other women who were being um, imprisoned in that uh, garrison. And Lola Rosa Henson later became a courier for the um, Filipino guerrilla movements. Thank you all for your answers. We have a question from Jing Williams for Judith. He asked, or they asked, you showed a little bit of the video in which the denialist spoke before the board. Is the video that you showed during your presentation available to the public? And where can the audience find such videos? Oh, um, that video, I don't know if it's still available. Um, it came, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors keeps our video archives and I got it from them. But when somebody went looking for it, like last week or something, they said that they couldn't find it. But you can find, if you go to, that actually was, um, a video not from the board, but from a committee of the board. In San Francisco, you have to go through a gazillion uh, like trials and you have to have all these regulations and you have to go before all these different committees and everything to get anything done. Um, so that was one committee. And if you go from, that all happened in 2015. So if you look around uh, between August and September of 2015, the Board of Supervisors, you will find um, those videos. And also, um, I, I think there are some clips uh, uploaded on YouTube by Steve. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so if you, um, I can um, search and send you the link um, to Ms. Jillian, uh, Williams. Um, but I think there are some clips available on YouTube. Okay, and also like I wrote a paper that, and Phyllis also wrote a paper um, that talk about the, the building of these two statues and we could send the links to William for that too. And I sent the link to William already. Yeah. Sharon, you mentioned during your presentation that um, they were going to reconstruct the Comfort Women Memorial near a church in their history garden. You did say what had happened with regards to the artists and how it was removed and they've been silenced. But I wanted to ask, did they pressure anyone that was managing the church that 
was owning that owned the garden were they also yes actually they did actually what happened was that um for about three days while we were building the pedestal where the statue was to be uh, placed uh, you know there's a coffee shop that was also being operated by the uh, by the church you know and there was a group of policemen it's just a very small coffee shop of about maybe three or four tables and a group of policemen um, uh, with their firearms no, occupied the coffee shop for the whole day and daring the service crew of the coffee shop to tell the redemptorist uh, fathers the priests that they are there and uh, you know they just stayed there the whole day for three days they were trying actually because the coffee shop was located just a few meters away from the pedestal and i think the main message was you shouldn't go on with what you are planning to do but of course we just ignored them uh, and they uh, went away but then when they went away that was when the artist declared that the statue was missing <laughs> Also, I received a question um, through a message because she wasn't able to get on. Um, how should we best protect the monuments? Um, how about hear from Merck and uh, Sharon? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the best way to protect the monuments is to build support for the campaigns and for the women and for the for the issue of um, and make it very clear to the, especially in the municipalities or wherever they are, that this will not be tolerated. If any any um, taking down or damage to the statues will not be tolerated, um, I think that's the best way. I mean, it's interesting because our statue has been vandalized like several times, and in fact, we we I think. William was just there and he might have noticed there was a scratch like certain uh in the plaques has been scratched out so we're constantly having to uh sort of redo the statue in that sense you know to repair it but uh this I don't think in San Francisco I really think the statue is there to stay unless there's you know massive earthquake or something <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree because um, in Glendale, when we uh, inst installed the monument and when the um, lawsuit was raised against the city of Glendale, actually the city council um, stood very strongly behind the statue. And uh, it was, you know, said during the um, event that one of the council persons said that you know, we really thank you, um, the community and especially the Korean American community for bringing the issue and bringing the statue to Glendale because this has, you know, put Glendale on the map and this has opened up our eyes and uh, it is such an important issue that, um, that you know, we weren't aware of it. So um, I, I think, you know, building community and working with different communities and building support is the best way to not only just to protect the monuments, but also to build um, the awareness um, in the community that such thing shouldn't repeat itself again. So. Um, and I, I, I absolutely think that it's important to work with the Japanese American community because, you know, because of the Japanese government, such a strong, um, with a huge war chest, um, is behind these lobbies, you know, Japanese American community. So sometimes, you know, some, some, uh, people in the community can be more susceptible uh, to those pressure from the Japanese government, but you know we really want to work with them and to help them understand that accepting the you know shameful history 
uh, does not make Japan or Japanese people a uh, bad people. Um, it all it you know look what happened in Germany. You know by accepting and educating uh, about their you know horrible history. Actually, Germany has uh, more respect from the uh, international community. And uh, you know, different communities are willing to work with Germans. So um, I think um, you know Japan will have a lot to gain by um, accepting the responsibility and uh, uh, trying to work together with the victim countries to um, um, to raise awareness and um, to prevent the sexual violence against women during wartime um, uh, from happening again. Yes, I can only fully agree with Phyllis and Judith about building uh, the, the, the necessity really of building a strong movement that will support and protect the comfort women legacy. And I think also this uh, related question or um, uh, that has to be done also is the issue of historical inclusion, uh, educating the young people. In our country, it's very, at least in the Philippines, it's very, very important because the advancement of the comfort women movement or cause for justice has been largely a private effort. We have had really no support from past or current uh, Philippine governments. And one of the things that will really have to be done is to sustain the movement itself. And how do we do that? It's really uh, the need to organize young people who will carry on the work, um, especially now that even we, the advocates and the supporters, are also uh, growing old and uh, passing away. And uh, well, hopefully not for uh, not us in the very near future. No, but but you know the the real need to be organizing young people to carry on with the work and to institutionalize the teachings of the historical uh, injustices that had been committed. Uh, by the Japanese government and all other foreign colonizers, actually, even the US, even the Spaniards, uh, in the case of the Philippines. Um, um, so these are the things that has to be done to be institutionalized in order to protect the legacy of the comfort women. And I think it's very, very important because the comfort women have become icons in the struggle of many women in the world for uh, justice, though they have not really achieved it, but the courage uh, and the tenacity and the commitment with which they have launched their uh, uh, struggle for justice is something really that inspires many women victims of military sexual violence in many parts of the world, even today. Thank you so much for your answers. I think also that the statues have allowed us to do education, like uh, both in um, in San Francisco and in Glendale. It was the building of the statues. After that, like after sort of that was achieved, that the next step right away was to go to the boards of education, was to go to the state board of education in California and say this should be included in the curriculum to work with teachers. But it was actually in the process of building this statue and using it. And in the process, I mean, Japan, people would say to us, all this over a statue? And it's, it's, it's sort of like, really? About sexual violence? And we would say, Yes, that's how important this issue actually is. And that's why we need to educate and, and really be um, clear with, um, yes, the next generations about this. I think that the building of the statues, at least I can speak for the ones in California, actually made it possible for us to educate hundreds and hundreds of people through the process. And ironically, the Japanese government helped us. Sorry to interject, but um, we are a little low on time. I do want to ask for the final question. Uh, could you all briefly describe the most memorial, the most memorable experience you've had when being around either of these monuments? Anything you've seen? Just briefly. Hmm. When I go to the Glendale Memorial. Uh, sometimes I have interviews and the meetings at the site of uh, where the memorial stands. I see sometimes um, uh, teachers uh, from the nearby church or school bring, or the parents bring their children 
um, or students to the site and uh, tell them about the history. Um, and they're not just Koreans, they're, you know, um, people from the community and uh, sometimes people um, come all the way to Glendale to see the statue and it's really touching um, to see the memorial, you know, being the very important tool to hand down this history to the next generation is, is the most touching part to, to see. In my case, it was a um, the response of Lola Estelita D when I told her that the statue on Rojas Boulevard had been removed. And she said, it's the only thing we've got. And they even took that away. Yeah, whenever I go to the statue, I'm just struck. I can't say that there's one moment. I mean, the unveiling was amazing and seeing Grandma Lee look at the statue, especially of Hak Sun Kim, and, and she said, I feel like she's right here with me. And that was really moving. And then, you know, all those girls, young women are modeled after real people. And in the case, especially around the Filipina, since I've worked with Gabriela for so long, I feel like I know these women. I, I know them. I, I'm feeling what they feel. And I think other people, when they view these women, they feel that too. They're really alive. They're not dead. And um, I think that that's very moving because it shows like this is a, this is a, a living issue. And, um, and I'm just struck by them and especially her. And people come, people come a lot and they put flowers on them. You might have seen in one of the pictures, they, they put flowers at the base, they lays of flowers, and it just shows how they view these women as, as really part of them. Well, I'd like to again, thank you all for presenting and being a part of this webinar. I really appreciated a lot of the new information that was brought up and that we were able to display that a lot of this and not just protests but even in the fight against human trafficking and sexual violence in general, still relevant to many different communities. And to close out, I would like to welcome once more, Director of the Monuments Toolkit, Sakina Moore. Thank you. Thank you, William. Um, and again, I wanted to thank Phyllis Kim, Sharon Cabasal Silva and Judith Merkinston for uh, giving us more insight into the Comfort Women Memorials. And a thank you for all of your work to bring awareness um, to this very um, important issue. Um, again, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. And I wanted to invite you to again uh, follow us um, to sign up at www.usicomos.org to receive updates on the work that we're doing. Again, I wanted to thank the Mellon Foundation. Uh, without your gener without the generous support, um, our work would not be possible. Also, please be sure to join us on our we next webinar, which is going to be September 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where the topic will be recontextualizing monuments of oppression with digital media. And please be sure to be, look out, to be on the lookout for our survey um, to get your feedback with regards to um, the, the webinars in general. And if you signed up for that, um, for the this webinar, you should be automatically receiving that in your email. Again, thank you so much uh, for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great weekend.